Hello Big Geeks and welcome to a barley field. Bradley, you're practically camouflaged. Well, you know, I'm trying to immerse myself in the culture of the green <laughs> and, and disappear completely. I, I was going to say, you're just going to try and live here now. It's a, it's a beautiful barley gold that you're wearing and oh, we're here you. for a wonderful reason, which is to learn all about some incredible new heritage varieties of malt that are being grown by crisp maltings up here in Norfolk. Now, you may or may not know, but the UK makes some of the best barley malts in the world. I'd say the best. There you go. You heard it here first. I'm claiming it for the best. <laughs> um, but actually, all of these heritage malts, these are all old school varieties. Some of them are British, some of them from Europe, and they're bringing brought back basically because they were let go because they weren't efficient. Yes. But they didn't really think about the fact that some of them were delicious. So the flavor, it was uh, at that point in the sort of history, flavor took a backseat to how much grain can we get out of this field yeah and how much how much sugar out of that grain as right. well so these new heritage varieties are really really exciting they're going to be bringing back new flavors new colors um, and new challenges for the farmers and the maltsters making it and we're going to be learning all about that before heading uh, to lost and grounded one of the great lager brewers in this country to try uh, their beer which we're holding right here made with the delicious hannah malt which is in this field that we're in right now so tune into this one it's a really interesting uh, really interesting video all about the challenges and the rewards of growing slightly more special barley and we will see you at the end to try some tasty lager Norfolk's Chris Malt have just released a range of historic malts, bringing back delicious flavours from the past using modern brewing. Over the next 20 minutes, we're going to trace the story of one of those grains, from field to glass. But not just any grain. This is the original pale lager grain. And not just any lager beer either, but a land beer made with purely British ingredients by one of the UK's best breweries. Like every beer though, the story starts in a field. So now I'm stood downhill from Dr. <laughs> Dave, uh, technical director at Crisp, um, and we're stood, quite obviously, in a barley field. What kind of barley? What can you tell Correct. me about it? We are in the field of Hannah. So this is one of our heritage varieties. Uh, it's an old variety, so it's been grown since the 1850s, uh, and it was selected in the Hannah Valley, which, was in, which is in Moravia, which is now the part of the Czech Republic. And it was the barley which contributed to the first Pilsen, the first pale Pilsen beers, which were brewed at the, uh, at the Pilsen Brewery. Wow, so the Pilsen Raquel originals would have been with absolutely, Hannah? Absolutely, absolutely. There you go, there's a story. So that, that's what this malt is, is you're hoping going to be used for, for, the, for lager brewing now? Tends to be, yeah, it tends to give us a very pale colour, which suits obviously that style of beer. And I wonder whether that early selection was because of the very pale malt colours that this particular yeah, variety back produces. then it would have been, people would have wanted it paler and paler because that's the yeah, way it was going. I think we were moving away from a darker, darker lagers yeah. into, into paler pilsens. Mm -hmm. and, and this barley variety seemed to suit that style of production. So what, why did it disappear and why have you brought it back? Ah, that's a good question. It disappeared uh, because its agronomics were not great. So we're studying a field. It's a res relatively tall variety. Yep. Uh, when the wind blows and when the rain comes down, it has a tendency to fall over, uh, which isn't great for the farmer. So uh, towards the end of the, the 19th century, the, 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 uh, the laws of breeding were discovered, the Mendelian laws of, of, of segregation and people started to actively cross the varieties to get the best attributes of each parent and th those attributes tended to be to improve the agronomics for the farmer as well as improving some of the malting attributes as well. So, so not much consideration about the flavour potentially? Not much consideration about the flavour. We seem to have come back round to thinking about flavour again. Uh, but those newer varieties, what were true varieties, hybrid varieties, had benefits to the farmer, so he quickly forgot about varieties like Hannah, mm -hmm. uh, because he was getting much better performance off of these new bred varieties. And it's only through our association with the John Innes Centre and New Heritage Barley that we've resurrected a number of historic varieties, one of which is, which is Hannah. And it's taken us probably oh, seven or eight years to get to the point where we're stood in the field of, of Hannah. Yeah. So uh, is, is it quite a daring thing to go to a, a farmer and say, hey, we've got this variety that was literally uh, discontinued because it was hard to grow and harvest? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so they have to have a little bit of an incentive to do it. So uh, 
not only is it relatively difficult to grow, uh, also the yield that comes off the field is probably half what he would get off of a modern spring barley. Right. So obviously he needs to get a little bit of compensation for that. But we've got some growers who are really enthusiastic for this project. So guys which we're working with you know, in successive harvests, some growing Chevalier for us, some growing Hannah for us, some growing Plumage Archer. Uh, and they're a part of the story as well because they're getting to relearn you know, what their forebears were, were growing, mm -hmm. much the same as we're having to relearn how to malt these varieties and the brewers how to brew with them right. as well. So, so this is a spring variety about to be on the verge of being harvested? Yep, so it's not actually a variety, so this is a selection. So ah. all these early varieties, are, oh, I said it myself, all these <laughs> early barleys are not varieties, they're selections. So someone has gone into a field and they've found what they look to be a promising ear of ear of barley and that's then been subsequently sown and built up in that way right, so wow. so this is this you know this comes from that original selection back in the 18 in the 1850s and the interesting thing about Hannah is that its genes can be found in modern spring varieties so it has been used as a parent within breeding programs okay so it's its genes have been propagated through into modern into modern varieties so it is a spring barley so it would have been sown in March, February time of, of this year. It'll be harvested, it's quite an early ripening spring variety, so it'll be harvested in early August if the sun shines again in Norfolk. Uh, we've had a lot of rain and not a lot of sunshine, so we desperately need some sunshine to just to finish off the crop. And uh, once harvested, then it will come into, into the maltings in Great River. We'll dry it, we'll store it, we'll look after it until we're ready to malt it later right. on in the year. And, and the processing of it is, is gonna be quite light? In yep, in. yep, so it will go through the floor malting, so keeping more tradition. So we've got a heritage variety, we've got a heritage malting plant to, to put it through, so a double story, really. Uh, and it will be malted, really, in the way it would have been malted 150 years ago. Amazing. Well, I think on that note, we need to go to Chris Maltings and see that very process happening. Chris Malt is found in the historic village of Great Ryborough and it's been there since it was founded in 1870. Since then, it's grown to become one of the UK's leading maltsters, but it's all centered around one hallowed building, the floor maltings. Here, they still follow the old traditions, germinating and kilning small batches of specific grains using historic methods and equipment. We were given a tour by Becky, who explained to us the full process at Crisp and how it differs when done in the floor malting halls, as all the Hannah malt is. So I'm here with Becky from Crisp, and Hi. we're in the hallowed space that is the floor floor malting room. Um, yeah. Before we get to floor malting, can you tell us just briefly, like what, what's a normal malting process, and then how is this different? Yeah. Um, so the floor maltings is a really small portion of our actual uh, total production here at Great Rybra. So a normal process is um, sort of quite a quick process. Um, it's an eight-day process in total, so two day steeping, four day germination, and um, can be as little as a 24 hour kilning. Um, so we're using big machinery, big fans, we usually have a, a much um, bigger bed depth and we're blowing um, air with those fans right through that and forcing the air through. With the floor maltings, it's a lot different. As you can see, uh, the bed depth for the germination is much smaller. It's spread right out across the floor. We're not manipulating any of the temperatures or anything like that. Uh, and when it goes to kiln, it's a much shallower bed depth and a long pr kilning process, so up to three days kilning. And mm -hmm. it's just a much gentler process. And that really adds to the flavour of the malt that we produce on the floors. So that longer germination time allows the malt to mature. It's got a higher modification, which basically just means that the proteins in the grain are broken down more. Um, so there's more sort of accessible to the brewer yeah, when it comes yeah, to it, so right? The, yeah, definitely. Um, and you're, it makes it a bit of an easier brew as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also the kilning, the gentler kilning profile really adds to the flavour of that. It's, um, it's almost like a slow cook kind of... To, yeah, definitely. allows those flavours to sort of mature through the kilning process. Yeah, right. So you're, you're not doing floor malting with, with all of your varieties. There's a, a certain selection that you guys have, have chosen? Yeah, so um, we mainly floor malt our heritage varieties. So so in that group we include the Hannah malt, um, Plumage Archer, uh, Chevalier and also our Marisotta which we do on the floors as well. Um, and so those are 
generally older style varieties that have originated from many, many years ago, so they're much more used to this style of malting. We find that with our newer varieties, more modern varieties, they can take the um, harsh sort of conditions of a modern kiln, um, but with the floor maltings, it's, they prefer the much gentler sort of... Right, because that's yeah. what they'd have been used to a, yeah, a century yeah. ago? Or? Yes, definitely. So um, when those varieties were coming through, this would have been the style of malting that was happening, mm -hmm. so they're much more used to that. So I'm really excited to see uh, what Hannah's going to taste like in a beer, and to do that we're going to head to one of the best lager brewers in the country, which means going to Bristol and to Lost and Grounded. With our heads full of ideas and malt dust, we headed out west and arrived in Bristol for a very special brew day indeed. Lost and Grounded makes some of the best lagers in the world, and their flagship Keller Pils is one of the beers that has brought great lager brewing back to the forefront of the craft brewing scene here in the UK. Excited at the prospect of trying a British malt for his lager, head brewer Alex also intended to use British hops, but in a nod to Hannah's Czech roots, he also added a decoction step to the recipe, something he'd never really done before. All of which might explain why I'm overexcited in this interview, and Alex is a little nervous. So it was an early start for me and Brad, but we're now here uh, with Alex, uh, founder of Lost and Grounded, and Mike from Chris. Um, thank you for joining us. Yeah. I guess the first question would be, what, what are we brewing today? Yeah, so we're doing a, um, a bit of a collaboration. Like, so it's really uh, exciting. We're doing what we think our version of like a UK land beer would be. Right, so, so, so well, what's a land beer? So it's, it's a style of beer that'd be in some regions of Germany, like quite localized beer, and it should focus on like the local ingredients. And here, as you know, like most of the time we're using um, continental malt, but actually for this project, um, we got in touch with Crisp and we're actually using um, the special floor malted Hannah malt, which right. is um, yeah, traditional, um, very, very traditional Pilsner malt um, production method. So really exciting. And, and when you got your hands on that malt for the first time, what were the things you noticed? Was it, was it very similar to the stuff that's being grown in the continent? Um, like there were some similarities in the flavor, like we'll see, and we'll see how the beer tastes. Um, I think it's um, quite interesting, like that sort of floor, floor malting process um, is quite, um, I guess the malt has a lot of character, I suppose. Yes, yeah, it's generally germinated slower, yep. but it just allows the malt to, same with when you age your lagers as well, you know, it's slower is better at times, and yep. same with when you're germinating the malt, the, the floor malt is a little bit slower kilnin's a little bit slower and gentler and it just kind of brings out nice subtle flavors from the malt yeah uh, giving natural processes time can exactly result in a, yeah yeah there's a there's difference. a german saying which is basically translate to be cold and slow yeah. so that's the way like you apply to the malting process and then also apply to the brewing process fermentation right you know so um yeah, it's, and it does make a big difference, especially making lager beer. So, yeah. Like, yeah, really big difference. So, um, so into, you're sort of almost trialing this with lots of different breweries at the moment and showing yeah. off what, what it could do. Why did you pick Lost and Grounded? First of all, the reputation. It's probably one of the best lager breweries in the country. That's craft lager breweries in the country. There we go. I'm honest. Yeah, so. um, <laughs> keep, keep going. <laughs> yeah, so. and, and the kit as well. Last year was a challenging growing season. It is a 200 year old variety. And, you know, it, it's, slightly, it's a higher nitro malt and it's, it's got lower modifications than normal UK malt. So we need to try it as well on, on kits that can uh, cope with a, a step mashing profile. Mm -hmm. So this kit's perfect and we've got it going um, in a few other breweries as well that can do the same thing. Just to make sure it's working, it, it works. This here, like we're, what we're brewing today, you know, we've mashed in at quite a low temperature, 45 degrees, just letting some of the um, some different enzymes take, take action, um, so that we can sort of break down that cell wall a little bit more, and then we go through all of our standard temperature rests that we do for other slowly, lagers. Slowly yeah. to point um, we're also doing it today, um, which we don't normally do at Lost and Grand, we're also doing a, de a single de decoction. So right. um, at the end of conversion, we'll, um, we'll pump two thirds of lot of ten and boil the remaining third. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what, um, if we get much color development from that or not. Um, our typical so lagers. Like almost the caramelization of those Yeah, yeah. So you basically. just get a little bit more biscuity character, but um, um, it'd be interesting to see. It should be, it's probably still going to be very pale, but it'll just give a little bit more nuance, a little bit different nuance. Beer can be amazing in all different ways, and it's actually, and it's amazing because of all these different things that are done. So I guess with a, with a Czech malt, the temptation would have been to brew a really traditional Czech style beer, but yeah. to make this lamb beer, you, you're also going for British hops. 
Yeah, yeah. So we um, we we sort of um, had a because we were speaking to Mark Dredge, who's coming down later on today, and we, and we were kind of thinking about what what could we do, which would be a little bit different. And for us, we we don't typically use um, English hops, and um, we thought, what if we did this sort of version of a, a land beer? It'll be it'd be more based on a Hellas. Um, and what if we take our standard regime, which is like Magnum, Perle, Mittelfrüse, so sort of three traditional German hops and, and use UK hops. So we're using um, Target, Challenger, and Golding. So I don't know, so I'm out of my comfort zone now. So I, we'll see what happens. <laughs> so a lot of people think about the heritage beers and think, oh, I, I have to make a, an old heritage malt. So with Chevalier, they think, oh, I, I need to make a mild. And it's definitely not the case because they, they, they bring lots of different benefits to, to beers, whereas modern varieties are, are bred predominantly for performance within the field and performance within the maltings and performance within big brewers, we kind of forget about the final taste in beer. And the, the heritage uh, varieties bring this back. They are, they are different, they add something different for the brewer. And yeah, they're, they're great in all styles. So we really encourage people to just try something a little bit different with yeah, them. Yeah, I think that's right. Because if you look at like, um Say in, in Australia, a lot of the a lot of the malting um, barley has been developed with very high enzyme content because it's actually mainly being exported to places where they're using a lot of rice, say in brewing. And um, but that's not, which is really great for that purpose. But it's not always custom made for what you need. Yeah. And I mean, a little bit of that is why we, we kind of use typically use our, our, our other pilsner malt is because it's sort of more designed for the beer that we need. But um, Really, really excited to see how this goes with, the, with yeah. this sort of heritage variety. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, not something I've done before. With the beer safely chilling out in the fermenter, the trail went cold for a couple of weeks, in which we were left to reflect on how much we'd learned about barley in the last two shoots. It's an obvious thing to say that malt is the unsung hero of beer, but working with Crisp on this video has made us finally comprehend what goes into growing it, processing it, and brewing with it, and just how much of the character of a beer is entirely dependent on it. It's fantastic that CRISP are bringing back these less efficient but extremely tasty varieties and selections, and hopefully one day the malts will proudly be listed on the cans like hops are, because they are just as important. With that in mind, when the first cans arrived from Lost and Grounded, we knew there was only one place we could go to enjoy it, back in a field of Hannah, among the seeds that helped start a brewing revolution and once again is making waves. Mate, what an adventure. I feel like I've learned so much yeah. along the way. Most importantly, when next time I go into a pub and somebody says, name some barley varieties, I've got loads now. I'm oh, going to yeah. be the most popular guy <laughs> uh, in the pub. <laughs> or least popular. Or least popular, probably, yeah. It's been really fascinating to learn. You know, I think, like I said near the start, we talk so much about the actual varieties of malt. We rarely talk about the variety or the selection. Mm, the selection. Of actual grains. Yes, yes. Um, and so there's definitely differences between all of those and differences in which you can treat them. So, you know, I loved the idea of the fact that, you know, this variety, Hannah, is grown really quite quickly but then it's treated really slow it's it's um kilns really slow and really low and then it goes into lager where yeah. we always talk about slow and low so the whole the whole malting process with the floor malting and everything that is that is slow and literally low isn't it yeah yeah and it's... then and then we brew a lager and it sits there at a low temperature for a long time and it ferments away slowly so there's there's uh you know these connections in nature that we've sort of broken because we've always looked for more efficiency or more hop and we start going to America or whatever it is. But actually nature provides really easy pathways if you want to take them. Yeah, man, this is like the, the slow cooking of the, the lager sort of beer world. Exactly, there we go. Great. Well, should we give it a go? Ah, oh, can't wait. So this is, this is nostalgic. This is the beer that uh, Alex was brewing. Ooh. What a sound. Okay, well, it's lively. There's head coming out the top. I'm excited about that. Bread. Bread that smells like crusty white bread. Yeah, man. And lemony, really lemony. So there was a decoction in this as well, which might amp up some of that bready, a little bit of caramel notes mm. to this, but this malt variety should already have really lovely honey and, and white crusty bread notes. And it does, it really does. The lemony freshness being in this field with the wind, kind of slowly undulating and uh, everything. It's very groovy, Brad's having a moment. If you, if you start singing Sting, then I'm walking <laughs> away. All right, cheers, man. Cheers. Oh, yeah. 
that's really special. It's interesting, all the tasting notes that we give, honey, white bread, lemon, you know, that you expect it to be really sweet, but it's beautifully dry, loads of kind of nettly prickliness mm. uh, from the Goldings down from, from Hukins, and then just a wash of beautiful rounded, um, doughy almost uh, malt character, and lots of kind of acacia honey, like kind of floral almost. This is beautiful, Johnny. My question to you is, do you think we could honestly pick this out from a, a lager not made of heritage malts? You know, I've been thinking about that while I've been spieling. Yeah. I've been trying to work out whether I could. And I think something that's a little bit different to uh, uh, lots of lagers, and particularly the other Lost and Grounded lagers, is a really lingering breadiness. Mm. Like, all of their lagers are super crisp and clean and finish quite quickly. Whereas on this one, there's a wonderful sweet doughiness left over. And I think that comes from the depth uh, from that heritage malt, from the fact that it's been matured for longer, from the fact that it has been kilned really low, really slow, I think you're left over with loads more of that bread character. So even when the lager snaps happen, when the hops have, you know, had their little bite at you, at your tongue, there's still sweetness left over, and that doesn't happen with a lot of lagers, which I think is really nice because you get refreshingness, and it's deep and it's complex. Just like me. Just like Brad. I'm walking off now. <laughs>